Praise God. Thank you so much. It is so wonderful to be here with you this week. And uh, I just want to uh, say thank you so much to the San Antonio congregation for your decades of support and covering uh, and your investment into uh, South Africa and uh, your covering uh, and headship, me and my wife and our family. And it is good to be here. And uh, what an excellent building. This reflects the excellence of our pastor and the excellence of the God that we serve. Our God is an excellent God. And I just so am just so appreciative. And uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm amazed, Pastor Ruby's confidence and the privilege of letting me preach here. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 5. A number of years ago, uh, Pastor Ruby made a statement in, I believe it was a wedding. It might have been in a single seminar, but I'm pretty sure it was in a wedding. And he was talking about moral purity. And he was talking about keeping yourself pure until the day of your wedding. And he made a statement, I'm probably paraphrasing a little bit, but what he was saying to every single person who is going to the altar to get married, he said, when you get to that day, you will have wanted to do it right. You're going to want the blessing of God on that day. You can either be clean or you can cheat and cover it up but you'll have to live with that the rest of your life. If you'll do it right, on that day, you'll be really glad you did. But if you cheat and cover it up and don't do it right, on that day, you'll really wish you had done it right. You know what, church? Every single one of us is going to have a that day. We're gonna leave this life and we're going to see Jesus face to face if you're really saved. You're going to have a that day. And you're going to want to have done it right on that day. And I want to preach tonight on the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to preach a sermon called, You'll be really glad you did or you really wish you had. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, begin reading in verse 6. So we always are confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Father, we love you tonight. We come before you by the precious blood, by the Spirit of God. God, we understand that there is coming a day. Help us to be ready so that that will be a day of rejoicing in Jesus' name. You'll be really glad you did or you really wish you had. I want to look, first of all, with you at we will answer. Here in our text, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He, both of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, much of that was to set some things in order. There were some things that were out of order in the church. And the context here, as he's speaking, is what happens to the believer when they die. And he is infusing in them a living hope and that there is a resurrection. The previous chapter speaks about persecution. He is encouraging them to have their eyes fixed on the unseen, on the eternal, not the seen which is passing away. And he is speaking to them about that there is persecution and injustice, but at the end there will be justice. And here in our text, Paul says that there is a motivation in this life for our conduct and for our behavior in this life. Verses 
9 and 10, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. He says we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. One translation says our only goal is to please God, whether we live here or there, because we must all stand before Christ to be judged. Each of us will receive what we should get, good or bad, for the things we did in the earthly body. This is our text is one of three main uh, uh, scriptures where Paul speaks specifically about the judgment seat of Christ and about the reality that we are going to leave this life and we're going to stand before Jesus, we're going to see him face to face, and he wants that day to be a good day for us. Not a day of regret, that this is a reality. This is going to happen, church. There's going to come a day where it's not going to be just words on the pages of our Bible. There is going to be a day. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We will not see death. We will not see the spirit of death if we die in Christ. We'll close our eyes or maybe not, but we will pass or be caught up in the rapture and in the blink of an eye we will perhaps close our eyes in physical death, open them, and then we will see Jesus face to face. That is going to happen. In Romans, Paul speaks of this, Romans 14, 10, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Romans 14, 12, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. He says that there is a judgment. This is not the great white throne of judgment of Revelation 21. That is reserved for sinners. That is for people who don't know Jesus. That is for people who will stand before the bar and the dead, great and small, were judged, and the books were opened. And they were judged according to the things that were written in their books. If you're here tonight and you're not right with God, you need to understand everything that you have ever done, ever said, ever thought, has been written in a book, and you're going to answer for that. That's actually happened to every single one of us. We have a book in heaven. I remember teaching this way, way back in our first church in San Marcos in a Sunday school about that there is a book and there was a woman in our church, her eyes got real big. And she lifted up her hand, Pastor, do you mean that I have a book in heaven? Yes, ma'am. Everything that I have done is written in that book? I said, yes, ma'am. Everything I have said has been written in that book? Yes, it has. And she said, oh, Pastor, I have a big book. I mean, no, we all have a big book. And we're going to be judged according to that. But the real good thing that happens is that when you get saved, there is a word in the Bible, it is the word justification. It literally means just as if, justified just as if, just as if you had never sinned. That when you give your life to Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ erases your book. And, the end, and in the eyes of God, he no longer remembers our sin. They are as, as if it never happened. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We do not face the great white throne of judgment as believers. Rather than a judgment of condemnation or a determiner of salvation, there are two purposes for the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. First of all, it is that we are to give an account of ourselves to God. We will still answer to God. Secondly, there is a recompense or a reward or a consequence for our works. The third foundational scripture about the judgment seat of Christ is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul talks about there is no foundation except the foundation of Christ. We are saved in Christ, in Christ alone. 
But then every man, every person builds their spiritual house. They build their life on the foundation of Christ. This is what we do as Christians. This is what motivates us. This is our works, if you will. And that work, our life, what we have done for Jesus, that is going to come under examination. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as though through fire. The judgment seat of Christ means we made it to heaven. It's not to determine salvation, it is to determine rewards. But there's, see, there's a little bit of a troubling phrase that is in that scripture and it talks about loss. And that's really what I'm speaking of, gonna be speaking about this, this evening. And so you think about it, what Paul is doing here is he's trying to prepare believers to have some kind of an understanding about getting ready and what to expect when you get there. You know, if you go someplace uh, on a vacation or someplace you've never been there, when we checked in at the, uh, here at the church for the conference, there was a greeting and a little bit of an orientation. Some places will actually have what they call a what to expect when you arrive or upon your arrival. And it's an orientation so that we don't do something foolish. So that we flow with the program and we know there. And this is what Paul is trying to help us to understand is what is going to happen to believers when we leave this life and we enter into the presence of God. And the truth is, as many Christians really have no clue as to what's going to happen. There's this false understanding or ignorance. It's just going to be one endless Club Med cruise without the vomiting or the flu or the seasickness. Endless bliss. One survey of professing Christians said that less than 20% believed that there would be any accountability for their actions on earth. Travel notifications. In August, my wife and I and Rick and Pam Glenna, we went to uh, Kenya. I was able to preach there in the church in Nairobi. And then after that, we went on safari. And when we got there, the, they checked us in and they said, look, here's some guidelines. These, this is not the zoo. These are not tame animals. And so you have to conduct yourself in a certain way. Rule number one, never get out of the truck. Doesn't matter how cute they might look. And the reason is, is the, the predators, the big cats, the aggressive animals, when they see a big safari vehicle, it's just a big thing. They might see your face, but they can't really differentiate that unless you get out. And then they see, if, if you would do that, they would see you're different from that and you are fair game. Ooh, look at that. Look, ooh, no claws, no fangs, no horns. I could eat that pink thing. Yes, I could. <laughs> Let's go ahead and put the video clip up. And so, you know, there are reasons why they give these instructions, but we don't listen to instructions. We think it's gonna be different. I took this video clip. <laughs> Don't get out of the truck. <laughs> See, when, when she went by, I'm realizing, okay, this is different than it kind of sounds. This is real. 
Paul's giving us some instructions. And he says that there is an accounting. It's wrong to believe that as Christians are not going to be subject to any kind of judgment. You know, all of our sins have been covered by the blood of Christ, but that is true, but we are still going to answer. Foundational principle of a kingdom is authority and accountability to that authority. Psalm says, you render to each one according to his work. Jeremiah says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. First Peter speaks of our father who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Revelation, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give me, to give to everyone according to his work. You know, there is a judgment. And when we hear the word judgment, you know, judgment is coming or there's a judgment. Let's be honest. Our thought is, you know, that's a bad thing. But that's not what Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He is saying that this is actually a good thing. It must happen. It is unavoidable. But it is a good thing. And I want to talk to you secondly about tears in heaven. And that's not an Eric Clapton song. Because there are building materials. Each one of us are building our spiritual life with what we do, what we say. Again, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it has been revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. We focus on that. And that's absolutely true. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so is through fire. God judges our words. He judges our works. He judges our motives. He does this for pastors. James 3.1, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. An evaluation. God's going to hold us accountable, preacher. The words we spoke over this pulpit. How we treated the people that God gave to us. We had a tremendous young man in our congregation, was married less than a year. He was working, he was doing an Uber driving on the side. He was carjacked and shot and left for dead. Nobody knew where he was. His wife was getting nervous, calling, has anyone seen, and so forth. She started calling the hospitals. Where he was shot and left, somebody, a neighbor came out and called an ambulance and they took him to the closest hospital, which was a, a cesarean delivery woman's baby hospital. They didn't do jack to him. He sat on a, he laid on a gurney for five hours untouched except with a bandage over his bullet wound that the, that the, uh, uh, that the ambulance driver left him there. We finally found out where it was. We drove out there. I got there just as they were transferring him to another hospital. This is a weekend. So there's all kinds of crazy, stupid, drunk trauma. Triage is backed up. There, nobody's able to get in. It's COVID. And so we're pushing, pushing trying to get this guy in, everybody's fighting. No, we were here first, and I, he was here, he was here. I said, how many, how many of these people have a bullet in them? And I pushed and got this guy into triage, and the wife was able to go in there. We were out waiting, nothing. We're not hearing anything, anything. Over an hour went by, called the wife, pastor. Nobody has seen him yet, and so I snuck in there. 
try to look like a doctor. <laughs> Went in there, there's 40 beds, they're all occupied, two doctors, two nurses. It's a whole train wreck, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a bad scene. He's laying there, they had stuck a tube in him, there is fluid and blood all over the floor. There's an untouched file laying on top of him. And I started pushing to get, where, where, is this, where are the surgeons? Is the theater, that's what they call surgery. Is the theater open? Is there, are there surgeons available? What's, what's going on? Sir, we're doing everything that we can. Everyone here is in critical condition. I said, that guy over there is reading a book. This guy here has a bullet in him. He's going to die without surgery. Sir, we're doing the best that we can. And I said, listen to me. We both know that people die in this room that don't have to. You need to get something going here. Who are you? I'm his pastor. <laughs> and they ran me out. <laughs> and so I called back into the, to talk to the, to, the, uh, to the wife. And she said, Pastor, both of the doctors are looking at him now. It was now another, it was another five hours before they wheeled him into the surgery facility. This is 13 hours after he got shot. It was another six hours. It was 19 hours before they started working on him. He survived this. The bullet entered under his armpit and lodged about an inch from his spine at the base. He came out of surgery and survived that, and I knew it. I knew it. I, I said, look, he's still in critical condition. I said, look, I'm going to give it 48 hours. They're going to need to open him up again because of infection and all the nicks and things that they didn't sew up, that the bullet nicked and the surgeons and all that, and that's exactly what happened. They let him out nine days later. He's in agonizing pain. They had to take out part of his pancreas. It was an absolute miracle that he survived this, but he's in absolute agony, back pain. They sent him back to a physical therapist, and I'm like, did they take the bullet out? And they didn't. And we had to push and push. It's too close to his spine. I want to see the x-rays. Yeah. And we pushed and pushed, and he went in a third time, and they took the bullet out. And he's back playing drums. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And you know what he's doing now? is every second Saturday he takes a group of people into that same hospital and he prays for the sick. And in the midst of that and praying for him and pushing him, I'm talking to his wife. She didn't know all of the questions to ask. I'm pushing this and pushing this and God smote my heart and he said, you should be fighting for everyone in your church like this. We're going to answer, Pastor. God has given us souls, and some of them are trouble. <laughs> but God has given us souls, and we're going to answer. Amen. We're going to answer for our ego, we're going to answer for our pride. We're going to answer for our ambition. See, what really troubles me in this verse 15, 1 Corinthians 3, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as though through fire. Loss. Christians will suffer loss. You know, what, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And let's just settle this right now that the idea of like, okay, who cares? I just made it for heaven. That's enough. That is unacceptable. Because to whom much is given, much is expected. Especially in our fellowship with a clear revelation of God's expectation for our lives. Ah, who cares? Well, yeah, no, I just... Uh, as long as I make heaven my home. Hey, hey, Paul. Hey, Peter. Hey, how's the golf swing? <laughs> the party can start. I'm here.
What does it mean to suffer loss? See, there's only one way into heaven. But people will enter in by one of two different ways. Either reward or loss. With joy or with tears. Second John verse 8, look to yourselves that we do not lose the things we worked for but that we may receive a full reward. 1 John 2, 28, And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 4, 17, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Well, wait a minute, preacher. The Bible says that, you know, that when we see him, we will be just like him. That will happen. But something's going to happen first. We're going to stand at the bar. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. What would shame look like for the Christian in heaven? What would that look like? This word shame in the Greek, it means disfigurement. It means that when that happens, when there's loss, how we appeared is stripped away. And the reality of what we are is revealed. Are you with me tonight? Amen. The word shame, it means a condition of humiliating disgrace or something to be regretted. I'm really not trying to ruin your day. I'm going to get us out of this. But this is a reality. This is part of the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be examined. You know, again, justification. Just as if we had never sinned. John writes and he says that if for Christians, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God. But what if we don't do that before we go? What if somehow we carry sin in our heart into eternity? Well, pff, it's under the blood. That's not what the Bible teaches. See, sometimes we need to hear doctrine. What about unconfessed sin at the judgment seat? How many know that would be a shameful thing? John Linton said these words, but God is also keeping a record of certain sins of the saints. This record includes all unconfessed sin due to an unrepentant heart, all unforgiven sin due to an unforgiving spirit, and all unfaithful service due to an unsurrendered life. A Christian who has wronged his brother and has never repented of his sin before God and man will have that unconfessed and unforgiven sin to face at the judgment seat of Christ. That has to be dealt with before entering into the joy of the Lord. An unsurrendered life. James 4, 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good but does not do it to him, it is sin. To him who knows that he should get his life together, his marriage together, his finances together, 
and go out on a Thursday night. Or go out on a Friday night. And I'm not talking about going out to Chili's. <laughs> and doesn't do it. Because he knows that God has called him to do it. To him it is sin. We're going to answer for an unsurrendered life. We're going to answer for that. That doesn't mean hell, but that does mean loss. We're going to answer for that. The parable of the talents. The man with one talent took and he hid it. I didn't, I didn't do anything with it. I didn't lose it. I didn't wreck it. I didn't allow it to be stolen. I just didn't do anything with it. Here, it's yours. And the master says, that is unacceptable. You're going to lose what you were given. There was a consequence. There's the issue of unresolved conflict. This has been a theme this week, hasn't it? There's been a lot of talk over the pulpit about getting right with each other. About dropping the attitude and coming under submission with your pastor. That has been a theme, not just in this conference, but conferences everywhere because there was a lot of that nonsense going on the last couple of years. And the appeal is always there because, listen, our strength, there is power in our unity. The Bible teaches very clearly there is power in agreement. And if we're going to have supernatural power, we're going to impact, this is going to be because we are in agreement and we are walking with those we're supposed to be walking with. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? And so the idea, well, you know what? I, it, it's a big building. I, I'm just going to sit on the other side of the building. Because I don't really get along with them anymore. Or pastor in the field, you're not in orbit with your mother church as you should be. That's not going to get a pass at the judgment seat. Emory Bancroft said these words, there will be a vast amount of healthy work transacted at the judgment seat of Christ. The mistakes of time will there be rectified, wrong judgments reversed, misunderstandings corrected, ungenerous attempts to impute falsehood or evil where such do not exist will be exposed. And in short, persons, ways, words, motives, and acts shall then appear in their true light and character. It will be a clearing up moment. Every difficulty and question between believers and God and between brother and brother shall then be righteously adjusted. You won't get right with your brother or your sister or your pastor in this life. That is going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. This is, this is, uh, well, it's just, you know, this is, you know, this is private. We're gonna, you're going to have your judgment seat experience in front of everyone. You know, my wife, when she is uh, baking in the kitchen and she's baking things that she gives away and I don't get to eat them. <laughs> she listens to Judge Judy audio <laughs> stuff. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. These reality, there's different flavors, different judges, right? But it's the reality, you know, judgment thing. And every once in a while, I'll be, you know, in my office and she'll say, oh my gosh, you got to come here and hear this. <laughs> because what it is, is, is two parties who are in conflict with each other, right? And it's usually, it's, it's monetary. There are, they're suing for money and damages and things like that. And there's a countersuit sometimes and they all bring their case before Judge Judy. And what really happens is the show advertises for this. They pay the, both parties' expenses and then they pay the damages. It's a free ride. These people get their moment. 
And so they think that, you know what, I'm going to get my, I'm going to get my, they're going to hear, and everybody on TV is going to hear how I'm right. And they were wrong and all that. And you know what, they're all fools. <laughs> Aren't they? Yeah. Even Judge Judy says it. That's ridiculous. <laughs> and she'll start asking questions. You know what, what, what? Okay, okay. We're about to find out just how foolish you have been. And she'll lecture foolish women about taking in dirtbag men. And then... And what happens is, is these people get, and they are absolutely certain that their cause is right. And they owe me that money, and there was no contract, there was no promissory note, which is what Judge Judy asks for. Was this? this, 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 this. No, you don't have a con you don't have a contract. You're out of luck. Is damages to, for the for the plaintiff. They are so sure that they are right in the, the righteous indignation. They get exposed for being complete fools. <laughs> well, we're not going to stand before Judge Judy. And your issue and your conflict and your accusations against your pastor is going to look foolish on that day. Again, John Linton, yes, Christians will be brought face to face at the judgment seat with every alienated brother, with every unredressed wrong and every unconfessed sin, with all unfaithful servant, all unsettled quarrels will be brought into account because, listen, we cannot enter into the joy of the Lord unless this is all settled first. If we don't get it right in this life, if we don't put to death our pride and our ego and our entitlement and our me first, See, this is the appeal. This is what Paul is speaking. We make it our aim, verse 9, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. There's going to be some work done. And so it's like so important that we get this done in this life so that we don't suffer loss in that life. I want to close and I want to talk to you about preparing for that day because there's another aspect of this. You know, the work of salvation, the end game of that is we're supposed to be like Jesus. Right? Right? Work of redemption is reconciling us to God and making things in our life right. That we might reflect the image of Christ and his righteousness. Romans 8, 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Conformed to the image well, how does that happen? We have to be brought before a standard. All of our selfish bent, all of our preferences, all of this is, see, it's going to be finally at that place. Okay, here's where the finished work is done of you becoming like Jesus. It's done there. And for some, that's going to be messy. Because you know what? 
You know what your pastor is trying to do? He's trying to get you ready for that day in this life. That's what his preaching is all about. That is what discipleship is all about. That is what correction at times is all about. Because the only way that that can happen is to be brought before a standard of judgment, a righteous standard. And this is a good thing. <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> so that judgment day... The judgment seat of Christ will be a day of reward. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Why would that be unprofitable for you? Because that day is coming. Let them have right of way in exercising righteous, godly, redemptive authority in your life. Let your pastor do that. Let your leader do that. Let him have that way. See, this is the work of pastoral ministry, and that is to prepare the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5 uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Ephesians 5, Paul is talking about, you know, husbands, love your, love your wives as Christ loved the church, right? But then verses 26 and 27 says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. See, this is what your pastor's doing. He is washing you with the word. He's getting you ready for that. According to the tradition of Middle Eastern marriages, beauty treatments, spa treatments, so that there would be a natural beauty and not bondo <laughs> and implants. There would be a natural beauty. The washing of the word this is the work of salvation. At the judgment seat of Christ, when it is all said and done and when, when everything is examined and that is sorted out, that is when the completion is done and then we will be like him. We need to prepare now. We need to get ready now. We need to get your heart right with God now. Need to get right with money now. Need to get right with headship now. And you need to pursue calling now. Because there is an opportunity like never before in the history of the church and in our fellowship for world evangelism. I'm finally getting there. Crowns, the runner's crown, the soul winner's crown, the crown for enduring temptation, the crown of righteousness when looking for his appearing, there is a pastor's crown or a shepherd's crown. See, we want that day to be a day of rejoicing. And so this Surrendering our lives to the calling is such like a really cool thing. I'm proof of that. We're in our 20th year of missionary work. It has been such an incredible blessing. It's, there have been times that have been challenging, but it has been such an incredible blessing and such an incredible privilege. And that there will come a day when it's all said and done, where we're going to be finished and we're going to be able, hopefully, with joy to say, Jesus, we gave it our very best shot. Um, so, pastor, listen to this. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. 
serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. It's going to be worth it, Pastor. It's going to be worth it. See, you're going to want to have done it right. You're going to want to have lived the sacrifice. You'll be really glad you did. We nationalized our mission church. I'm about to stop here. We nationalized our mission church in Botswana. We planted that church in 2013. We nationalized it about a year and a half ago. They had really hard lockdowns. That church had not had a revival for two years. I was able to finally go up there and preach. There's two churches. Now there's three in Botswana. That's it. One in the capital city of Khabarone, one in Francistown that we planted. Preached three nights in Khabarone, hired a car, drove up there to Francistown. We had a, we had a wonderful time. I'm driving back early in the morning. I had to get a COVID test and get the results and then fly the next day back into South Africa. But I was going to preach that night, just one service in the capital city church. But as I'm driving, God impressed upon me very strongly to go to the David Livingston Memorial just outside of Haberoni, Botswana. David Livingston, missionary, doctor, explorer, What's not really known is how much David Livingston and his party confronted the slave trade. Slavery had been outlawed in the British Empire, but it was still being practiced in South Africa, many places. And he would go and confront that. There were, at times, armed conflict. And there was a party of Boers, Afrikaners, slaveholders that fought against Livingston and his people Livingston fled across what is now the border of South Africa into Botswana. And he withdrew there and he began to just minister. He gathered about 100 people. He built a house and he built a chapel. And it was there in the chapel that he would minister. His wife, Mary, would cook scones, like think biscuits, and would teach the natives English out of a Bible. Every morning they would come for their English lesson out of the Bible, but they had to have their English lesson before they got their biscuits. There's nothing left there except the foundations of both of those buildings. There's a memorial, there's some information there. <clears throat> And I was there with the pastor from the Hyperoni Church, and we were the guide was giving us the tour, and I was I'm thinking, you know what, God, it would be really cool if I could maybe get something from here. Let me go ahead and put that photo up. And I looked down, and there right there in front of my foot was this nail, I know it's too small. There it is. This is a nail that David Livingston drove into the wall of his church building. And I was laying there on the ground and I picked it up. And I'm thinking, I don't know how much longer I'm going to have in this part of the world. David Livingston was attacked by a lion. He shot it. It had been eating the natives' cattle. He shot it. The lion was still alive, caught him by his left shoulder, shook him like a rag doll, splintered the bones in his left shoulder. He couldn't use it for the rest of his life. That was in his first missionary trip. He went back to, back to Scotland and then went back for a second journey was there that he charted and mapped much of the interior of Africa. 
And he left a legacy. You can go to virtually any country in sub-Saharan Africa, south of the Sahara Desert. It doesn't matter if it was colonialized by the English, Portuguese, the French, the Dutch, or the Germans. You will find in any of those nations something that is named Livingston. Livingston School, Livingston Hospital, Livingston something. This man left a name. And I picked this thing up and I said, oh God, what, how little I have done. We have an opportunity to go virtually anywhere in the world and do something for Jesus. And what my wife and I do and have done is we've just run in our lane. Not everybody's called to do what we're doing, but we're just running in our lane. And it is an incredible privilege to have stepped into the footpaths of what others have done before. We're going to answer to God. We're going to give an account for how we've lived our lives. We have an opportunity to get heart issues right. And we have an opportunity to go and do what God has called us to do. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. Very quickly, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to give an invitation to anyone here tonight. You're not saved. You're not right with God. Everyone will stand before God and give an account. Are you right with the Lord? Is your heart right with God? Are you forgiven of your sins? Are you backslidden? Do you need to rededicate your life to Jesus? The blood of Christ is the only agent strong enough and powerful enough to wash your sins away. Would you open your heart to Christ? Would you give your life to Jesus? Would you rededicate your life to Christ, backslider? Would you open your heart? You're here tonight and you need Jesus. You'd say, preacher, I want to open my heart to Christ. I want to get right with God. Lift up your hand right now. Lift it up. Anyone at all, lift it up. Backslider, I see a hand. God bless anyone else. I see a hand. God bless you. Anyone else? This day is coming. I see a hand. God bless you. Anyone else? Settle it tonight. Make heaven your home. If you lifted your hand, I want you to do one thing. Just get out of your chair. Come to the front right here. Somebody's going to meet with you and pray with you. Come, come. You lifted your hand. Come out. Come out. Come find a place to pray. Speaking to Christians, we have an opportunity. This is much of what we've heard this week is about restoring things that are unresolved, relationships that are unresolved. We have an opportunity. For some, there needs to be a profound repentance. Change the course, the trajectory of your life. Have this under the blood. Because it's possible to start afresh and to gain rewards. And everybody is singularly responsible for this kind of a choice and at this altar. My brother, my sister, will you go? Will you answer the call? Will you stop making excuses? Will you go tonight? Will you go tomorrow night? You can go to your pastor. There can be announcements. 
Will you answer this call? Because I'm telling you, it is going to be so worth it. If you'll do right, you'll be really glad you did. If you don't, you'll really wish you had. These altars are open. Let's come find a place to pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. In all that is within, I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. Giving up my dreams, I'm laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of a new life. And I, I surrender all to Saith the Lord thy God this night, it is, a, is it a light thing that I have called you to follow me, saith the Lord? Is it grievous for you to do my will, saith God? For surely I have called you to great things that are beyond your wildest dreams, saith God. And surely I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has entered into the hearts of men the things that I have planned for those who love me, saith the Lord. Know that I come quickly and that my reward is with me. And so put away from your heart that it is grievous to serve me, for surely I will show you wonders and I will use your life and I will take you places and I will show you my glory and all that you set your hand to do. Only let your life be surrendered and put into my hand and I will surely bless you and I will cause you to be fruitful, saith God. And I will enlarge your vision, I will enlarge your heart, and surely I will cover you, and I will surely be with you even to the ends of the earth, saith the Lord thy God. Hallelujah.
We're going to take those crowns. We're going to cast them before him. That's not the motivation. Paul says that whether here or absent, our aim is to please him. He bought me. God, let my life be pleasing. God bless you, Pastor. Hallelujah. You can have your seat. We thank God. What a powerful, powerful message tonight. Hallelujah. And we thank God for everything he's doing. Hallelujah. And so I'll give you a moment, everybody, to kind of get resettled there. And uh, we're, we're very, very excited. Uh, I was uh, just uh, sitting there, just looking at this. Uh, Andy and Heather, 20 years in the mission field in Africa. And I could not help but think, as our brother was preaching, are, it, will we get, have another couple give 20 years of their life to the mission field? That's really what we need. And uh, it's a whole different story when you spend your life laboring in these nations and you say, wow, what a powerful preacher. You get that kind of preaching by spending 20 years in the mission field. And so is a, they are a gift to this congregation, to these fellowship of churches. They've set a standard for missionary work. When Andy and Heather went uh, to uh, Cape Town, their uh, 2000... Uh, we didn't, none of us thought it would be a 20 year venture, uh, but they fell in love with the people and the, saw the possibility of God and uh, they are an incredible blessing and an example. And I, I couldn't help but think as he, and he was preaching, I said uh, that, uh, there are some couples here. It's not just where well, I'm going to go and prove that I'm willing to go, but some couples here that God wants you to spend your life, your youth, uh, doing something for God in another country because that's the only way. We have powerful church planning churches in South Africa today, uh, but that only happens when you have people willing to stay for a long period of time. And so anyway, we thank God for that. Okay, uh, we're here to make some announcements tonight. And, uh, and, uh, and so there are a number of things we're going to do. One of the blessings is that uh, you plant churches those churches begin to grow and develop. Remember, we're not planting churches, we're planting churches that plant churches. That's our goal. And we're beginning to see that from so many different directions. And so we have some exciting announcements today. And I wanna begin with uh, some uh, announcements because these people can't come here. You know, uh, in America, if you try to get in here legally, it's very difficult. And uh, we have people around the world that, that are want to come. We wanted to bring them, but it's impossible for get, uh, to get them visas. But we want to make a number of announcements tonight. We want to announce that uh, the Ho Chi Minh Church, this is Pastor Barrientes Church, the first, our first uh, national Vietnamese pastor is being launched tonight. Um, uh, and they're, they're going out of the, into District 4 out of District 10, and this is Pham and B. Lam Kum Phong. Let me see if you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, I know Pham, uh, in the early days, uh, I have preached barefoot next to him a number of times, and he is the interpreter, excellent young man, and uh, this is a great victory that we're able to see. Vietnamese men are now going to catch the vision, and... Uh, I can tell you there are other, we had 25 Vietnamese pastors show up at our last rally in Malaysia a few weeks ago. Uh, there are other Vietnamese young men that are lining up to get sent out and, uh, and uh, are going to make an impact there. And we thank God for that. We also want to announce uh, a, the first national pastor from the island of Barbados, going into St. Philip's Barbados, Damon and Maria Agard. Hallelujah. There they are right there. Hallelujah. Rudy Estrada has done just a, a, a fantastic job and are now stepping into church planting. And we thank God for that. Uh, and this is what it's all about, folks. This is what we're trying to do. This is what our effort, you, and uh, you heard Kalani tonight uh, and Kusta. You, you, this is what we are after. 
And so that is a great, great blessing. We wanted to announce tonight, this just happened a few weeks ago in the uh, uh, South African conference. So they, they have their conference in September, but uh, we wanted to acknowledge tonight that uh, coming, uh, going into the city of Charlo, South Africa, Jean-Pierre and Valencia Dreyer out of the Port Elizabeth Church. I think he might be the first Jean-Pierre in our fellowship. I've asked her, hallelujah. And then also we want to announce uh, uh, just uh, uh, recently planted, again, they cannot come, but uh, we wanted to plant them from here, but they couldn't come here legally. I did think about other ways to get them here, <laughs> but uh, going into Guadalupe, this is in Nuevo Leon, Mexico, suburb of Monterey, Angel and Sonia Rivera out of the Monterey Church. Hallelujah. And so we want to just acknowledge this is what we are after. Grandmother churches that are church plants. And we thank God for that. So we have a number of we want these people to come as we call them going into the island of Rotan, Honduras, um, out of the Austin Church, Nur and Rebecca Rashid. Hallelujah. Noor and Rebecca served as missionaries in Limon, Costa Rica, and the island of Rotan is a, is a kind of a mixture of mestizo, Spanish speakers, and Caribbean. And I thought, do I know anybody that could do both? Uh, who came to mind? Amen. Uh, divinely equipped, I told Noor, you are like Moses. You have been divinely equipped for this island, uh, and we're looking forward to a great report. Going to begin a brand new church in the city of Da Nang, Vietnam, out of the Austin Church, Gabriel and Diane Martinez. Hallelujah. Da Nang is a key uh, city in Vietnam. It was a major city uh, with regard to when the war was there. There was a very large American presence there. Even to this day, it has a, a, a strong American presence. And uh, we began to pray about Da Nang a while back and uh, beginning to try to get the mind of God for that. And then I was reminded that uh, Gabriel uh, had come to me a year ago and wanted to go to Vietnam. And he said he's been, him and his wife have been praying for five years to get an opportunity to go to Vietnam. They have a powerful, uh, they have a powerful uh, church that God is raising up there in Kyle. And so we thank God this young couple is responding uh, to the need. Amen. I want to announce this, and I announced this last year, but I want them to come uh, and bring them before you. Uh, and uh, Brent and Sarah Harris were in uh, China two years ago in 2020 when they were under total lockdown. They were throwing out our missionaries. And uh, I remember Brent and I were talking. We felt that he was, him being thrown out was imminent. We also knew with the COVID restrictions, if they came back here, they would not be able to do anything. And so we had said, if something happens, we're just gonna try to get you over to Hanoi, not too far away, and we'll move on from there. Well, it turned out that Brent turned out to be the last American missionary in China. And finally, last year ago in September, uh, they finally tossed him out. Brent and Sarah arrived here, and I didn't check with him, but I would think somewhere in the first week that he was here, uh, Bridget, his mother, was diagnosed with uh, leukemia. And so uh, we said, well, we'll announce you to go, but uh, it became clear that God had brought them there to be able to spend one year taking care of his mother. Yeah. You know, we didn't plan it this way, but... Uh, they were there, our sister, I appreciate the words of Roman spoke this morning. And uh, so uh, she's gone home to be with Jesus. 
And uh, Brent says, we're ready to go to Hanoi now. And so I want Brent and Sarah to come. They're going to Hanoi. <laughs> Hallelujah. We want to announce tonight, planning a brand new church in the city of Hanover, Germany, is uh, Tony and Lourdes C. Snettles, if they'll come right. We have been working on this over the summer, and, uh, and uh, we have felt this, uh, he really felt inspired about this city. Uh, if you were to look on a map, it's uh, close to our churches, as now there's a momentum going on in Germany, and uh, felt this would be the mind of God, and so they are already there and setting up things, and so we thank God for that. We have to announce also tonight, we'd like to announce going into Vrieden, Germany, out of San Antonio, Mark and Veronica Mata. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, everybody, everybody from San Antonio says, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Because Mark walks around here speaking German, uh, everybody. Uh, it is very difficult to get into Germany. Tony mentioned that in his message, how difficult, it's very, very difficult to get into Germany. Uh, and, uh, and just out of, a, it's a long story, it's a miracle, Mark's working. Uh, somebody says, hey, why don't you apply for this job? It's a German company. They hire him, love him, and then start to give him a German visa to go to Germany and train. He meets Germany. He comes back, brings his wife. I think he spent a total of around 45 to 60 days there. Uh, came back. Uh, the company has plans for him here in San Antonio, but they fell in love with Germany and said, we want to do something for God in Germany went to his company and they said, well, they'll use his visa to allow him to go there. And so they're going to be going to Germany here in a few months. We thank God for that. <laughs> going into La Paz, Bolivia from McAllen, Victor and Jessica Lopez. Victor and Jessica are a tremendous blessing. They uh, served in La Paz for many years, did a great, great job there, very skilled. They pioneered a very a powerful church. Pastor Gilbert has there in Monterey right now and, uh, and uh, excellent uh, missionary workers and we're looking forward to great impact there. And we also want to announce tonight, uh, going into the city of San Pedro Sula, Honduras, uh, from San Antonio, John and Juanita Flores. God, John Juanita, uh, pastored. If you pastored for seven years in the West Side, you can go anywhere in the world. <laughs> and uh, thank God, uh, God has uh, blessed them. Uh, been great blessing here. Came back with a great spirit, great attitude. Said we just want to help serve, and uh, and so we thank God for that. Um, amen. We wouldn't have our trees if it wasn't for John. And so we thank God for for him. I, I, as far as San Pedro Sula, I, I want to, I asked them to put up a pic. You got that pic I sent you? If you do, please put that up. Okay, I want you to see something here. And we, we do this with a strategy in mind. I, this is just a little snapshot I took from my phone. There you know that you have Luis Alcala and Chetu Mall. If you move down, it's only a couple hours away, is Belize City. We actually have, I think, eight churches in Belize now. And... Uh, then if you move down from there, there's the island of Rotan. You see that? Uh, there's La Ceiba. That's where the Bernals are. Now we have a city of one million people, San Pedro Sula. It's a very key city to what we're trying to accomplish uh, as we're beginning to populate this region of Central America that the world has forgotten about, but God has not forgotten about.
And if you're interested, I can tell you about three more cities that are in that area right now that need pastors. And so we thank God. Isn't God good? Amen. These churches, every one of them. Okay, I, 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 uh, I was thinking hearing what Andy was saying, and I thought, uh, who knew he was exactly on the same path that I was on? I want to receive an offering tonight for world evangelism. This is not what we have done on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, or what we will do tomorrow. This is dedicated to world evangelism. This does not help pay the conference expenses at all. I mean, after what Pastor Greg preached, after what Pastor Anderson preached, I don't think I should have to say a lot, but I'm going to say something. And I came across this very interesting, my brother Fred uh, uh, brought it to my attention. Can you put up that headline I sent you there? I need these guys, uh, you got that? Uh, amen. There it is. Listen, this is from an NBC. It says, belief in hell boosts economic growth, Fed says. And I want to read you a little bit of the article. It says, economists searching for reasons why some nations are richer than others have found that those with a wide belief in hell are less corrupt and more prosperous, according to a report by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Then it goes on at the end of the article, Ellen Johnson, president of American Atheist Incorporated, I'd hate to be married to her, <laughs> called the study the latest gimmick from the religious establishment to drum up government support. She went on to say religious people cannot rely on their theology to promote what they, uh, what they do. They, people cannot rely on their theology to promote what they do, so they turn to other things, she said. So think with me for a minute. Here they are. They're trying to study why are some nations and peoples more prosperous than others, and they use all kinds of data, and they cannot get away from the fact that a, uh, when you go to a people group that believes in hell, they are more prosperous. And it, it causes us to stop and ask ourselves, well, what, what's going on here? Why is that so? And I, I want to look at that with you for a minute before you make your decision what to give. Here we are in 2 Corinthians 5. The Apostle Paul, I'll read it to you, you just heard it. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Why are people who believe in hell more prosperous? First of all, let me give you three reasons. Number one is because we believe the Bible's true. And if you want to prosper, believe the Bible. Doesn't the Bible say that uh, uh, this book shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate there in day and night to observe to do everything that is commanded, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Wherever you find a people who take this book seriously, there will be prosperity. There will always be prosperity because they will understand that God has set creation in order and he has given us a roadmap to blessing, and, uh, but you have to follow the word of God. Um, and, and so that's an obvious one. The second reason is this. If you believe in judgment, then you understand that our decisions, we're going to answer for them. People who believe in hell understand that, you know what, there's going to come an accounting. I'm going to have to explain my life, just, I, just as Pastor Anderson just said. I'm going to have to be honest with God. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he goes on and says, it is a fearful responsibility. No, we are living in the age I mentioned where today people have anxiety over judgment. Anxiety is the fear of judgment. This is what Paul says. He says that the knowledge of judgment informs my choices. I wake up every day, Paul says, feeling a sense of responsibility that one day I'm going to answer for this life. You know, years ago, Yolanda and I had the privilege of going to the ruins at Corinth. It was a small team. It was the first team Pastor Mitchell put together for many years. And I mentioned there might have been half a bus. There might have been 30 of us on this trip. And we go down into the ruins of Corinth and, and the guide is taking us through and he's explaining how this would have been the marketplace um, and he's showing us the marketplace and he's describing how there would have been merchants that traveled from Europe 
merchants that traveled from Asia and Corinth was kind of the melting pot for it all. And I'll never forget it. As we were walking through this marketplace, we came to this place right in the middle of the marketplace. And he said, this is the Bema seat. That's what the word means. The judgment seat of Christ here is the Bema seat. And it was the place where the civil authorities would, uh, I guess, as Andy says, do judge duty. It was here where the common man would go and they would have their cases heard and judgments were rendered. And but what struck me, it was in the middle of the marketplace. And so the idea that suggested there is that you and I sometimes get so involved with the marketplace that before we know it, we're before the beam of seat. We can get so caught up with this world and everything that's going on and trading and making money and doing things and living life. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, we're walking and next, you know, here we are, we're at the judgment seat. And it's almost like you're not careful. You'll be unprepared. You will become so distracted by life that you forget that somewhere you're going to take a step and there's the bema seat of Christ. There's the judgment seat. And when people live with that, it does something to them. Did you hear what that article said? They're less corrupt. They have integrity. They understand that there's something that I'm going to answer for. And it does something to them. And that is why we need sermons like tonight. To be reminded, wait a minute, I'm a Christian, but I am going to stand. And Paul said, this is a fearful responsibility. You know, if you have a King James Bible, it says, knowing the terror of the Lord. To know and wake up with that. That I'm going to answer for all this stuff. That here I live in the richest nation in human history. That for us, owning two cars is nothing when 90% of the world doesn't own one car. And, and if we're not careful, we just kind of forget that. And Paul says, every day I wake up with that responsibility. But here's the third reason. And that is, they said the belief in hell makes people prosper. So I'll give you the third reason. Because we know that hell is real. And when you really know hell is real, that, has some, that, that translates in your life. Now, you might say, I believe in hell, but do you really believe in hell? Because when you believe in hell, then you understand the priority of life is eternity. This isn't about just having fellowship churches in different parts of the world. It's about saving souls from hell. It's about that burden. It is taking eternity seriously. And you show me a man or woman who takes eternity seriously, I'll show you a man or woman who gives seriously. Especially when it comes to world evangelism. Because that is what we are. We are a soul-saving operation. That is everything. You saw the video? You know what the video showed? Trying to save a soul. Movies, rap, street preaching, knocking on a door. That is what compels us to do what we do. And when people believe that and they understand that, then that is why it motivates us. Do you know why the false doctrine of once saved, always saved that's a false doctrine, eternal security. Do you know why that's become so popular? Because it alleviates Christians of their personal responsibility to try to get people saved. Because it says to us, it doesn't matter if you outreach. It doesn't matter uh, that you try to win somebody. Everybody's going to be saved in the end anyway. God forgives everybody, universalism. And, and, and yet here's the apostle says, a fearful responsibility. And it does something to him. It makes you check your priorities. He says, we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord. We work hard to persuade others. Here's a man who believes in hell. And because he believes in hell, then this awesome responsibility, this burden, and that is why we do these Thursday night world evangelism and we stop everything else we're doing and we say, wait a minute, this is, conference isn't about us. It's about the people we can reach. It's about the nations and the cities that we can reach. It's about these people stopping their lives. It's like uh, just getting to the video and just stopping and pausing their lives and whatever their plans were, whatever their dreams were, 
they said, I'm putting them entirely on hold to go to another place because people are going to hell. Let me just give you a couple of scriptures here and I'll finish up. Because we are sending, these, these folks are going, we are funding them. We are the senders here. And I want to tell you that hell, listen to me, the principle of hell and sending are linked together. And all you have to do is go to Luke 16, verse 24. Listen to what it says. Lazarus said, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send, send. Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. That's what hell said. Send. And then later on, the rich man said these words in verse 27. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them unless they come to this place of torment. See, they're going. They're the modern day Lazarus. This man's cry is send him. It's words from a man in hell. Send him. Send him. That's our priority. That's, that's what we're all about. And so when I read this article, I thought, yeah, it makes absolute sense to me that people who really believe in hell, it, their entire view of finances is different. And tonight I'm asking you to sacrifice. I'm asking you to make saving a soul a priority. He said, because I believe this. I believe it's real. I believe it's eternal. And if it's true, that means that I should do everything I can to propagate this message. And especially the nations of the world. 90% of the world's preachers, they say, are in America. And these people are willing to go. The challenge is, are we willing to stand? I want you to bow your heads. And uh, as we're doing this, we have uh, many... Uh, our opportunities to give tonight, as you know, we have a Secure Give uh, app, or you can go to our website, and through our website, you can do that, and uh, you can respond tonight. Of course, if you write a check, you may get out to the door. If for some reason, you don't have the ability to do either tonight. You can write on a piece of paper. This is what I'm going to give. I'm going to either bring it tomorrow or I'm going to send it in. You don't, read, you don't need to put your name. God knows your name. But I'm telling you tonight, church, this is, this, is, this is what it's all about. It is a wonderful blessing to have so many people, and there are others that have made themselves available. Thank God. Tonight, we must respond like people who believe this. That hear that cry and understand that is what hell will, oh, that's the cry of hell. Send, 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 send. Thankfully, we've had workers and quality pastors that say, hey, I want to go. But will we be, we be the senders? And I'm asking you to sacrifice Please don't be a token tonight. Don't just say, oh, I'm just going to this. Hell's not a token. This is serious business. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to move. Let God speak to your heart. Wait on him. Listen to him. You heard what Pastor Greg said the other night. Dominion with money. Dominion with money. Mammon, as Pastor Wakefield said, is not going to tell you what to do. Amen. Father God, I thank you, Lord, tonight for the privilege of being able to stand before so great a people. I ask you to lay hold of our hearts, God, with the urgency of this message. I thank you for these workers that have responded. God, I thank you that you are opening these nations to us. God, I pray that you will prevail, God, that we will not just be willing to go, but there will be many, many people willing to sacrifice and give. Raise up an army of senders tonight. 
provide and bless, open the windows of heaven and pour supernatural resources that will flow powerfully through this people, God, to the nations of the world. And we thank you for all this. In Jesus' precious name and all of God's people said amen. Let's obey God tonight. Sing a new song to the Lord and let the nations see that our God alone is wonderful. Every day his people shout. children's church come right now amen uh, you know you'll know the rapture soon because I'll remember this before <laughs> come on up here hallelujah and they have been uh, uh, giving uh, all week and uh, so they're going to come we want to acknowledge this amen what a great blessing here amen here they come hallelujah Okay, amen. For world evangelism, $4,054.96 um, for world evangelism. You look pretty good. What, what country are you from? Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, he's, that's true. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Let's all stand together. Thank God. What a glorious night. Uh, amen. We're going to have a great day tomorrow. Hallelujah. Let's, let's run to the finish line. I would say go home and get some sleep, but I know that's not going to happen. But, but we'll be here tomorrow. We're going to have a great, great door, a great night tomorrow night. Praise God. Our heads are bowed. Thank God for the grace of God in this place tonight. Josh Steele, I know you're here somewhere. Will you close us in prayer?